Is it? It is on. Okay. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> um, I have to assume that by those of you who are still here on a Sunday afternoon are kind of hardcore attend conference attendees and um, and most likely um, for you to forego any splashy Mother's Day celebrations, you have decided to be here because um, it's most likely that most of you have a story that isn't going the way that you thought it was going to go. And I am not an exception to that. Um, I'm not a multiple, multiple myeloma patient. Um, I'm not a multiple myeloma survivor. But this disease has changed my life three different times in the last 15 years. And each time that it surfaces, it's unexpected, and it writes chapters of my life story that I wasn't anticipating, and it changes it again and again and again. And I thought today I would share with you a little bit about those stories and um, in hopes that they maybe you know, contribute a little bit to your own or that they're a piece that um, help perhaps change the course of your own stories. The first and biggest time that multiple myeloma changed my story was when I was 20. I was home from college and I was almost as bouncy and as youthful as I am right now. <laughs> and I was spending the summer playing local tennis tournaments here in Vancouver. And it was between, it was between practice sessions at our tennis club when Chad walked in. And he was tall and dark and handsome, and he walked with this confident swagger that my 20-year-old self was just swooning over. And um, I can't definitively stand here and tell you that it was love at first sight, but I can tell you it was sparks on sight for sure. Chad was charming and generous and a really good tennis player. And he drove a motorcycle, which I'm sure you can imagine for those of you who are parents would have loved your daughter to fall in love with somebody who was whipping around all summer long on a motorcycle. But even though I was young and new to love, I had a feeling that this guy was probably for me. Um, Chad, though, didn't necessarily agree. Uh, Chad had had a much bigger life than I had had up until then. He was nine years older than me. He had already graduated university and he lived on his own. He already had a career and understood what grown-up phrases like tax time and budgets, what they meant. <laughs> um, but there was also another part to Chad that was a little bit more adult and or it caused him to grow up faster and that was because he had cancer. And he had been diagnosed with multiple myeloma and had his first bone marrow transplant before our relationship had ever started and before we ever started dating. So fortunately, by the first time that multiple myeloma entered my life, it actually felt like it was something of the past. And over the next few years, like Chad's cancer counts, our relationship fluctuated. Our relationship would dip when I would go away to school and then it would spike again when I was home for the summers. And um, it was exciting, it was youthful, and most times it was very uncomplicated. When I was home from school and graduated, we finally decided to give our relationship a real shot. And we let ourselves fall in love, I moved in with him, and like all great love stories, like The Notebook or Love Actually, or Magic Mike, um, I thought our story would be one where we would be together forever. But unfortunately for us, right in the middle of us writing our love story and how I was planning on the rest of our life looking like, um, another story or another character entered our story and it changed a chapter for us and her name was Myeloma. It was like there was a polygamous threesome and I chose to love whoever and whatever Chad came with. And I had entered the relationship knowing that Chad had already a pre-existing lifetime partnership with her. 
When Chad's health was, health was doing well, I became the number one wife in the relationship. And once in a while, though, myeloma would come back and I'd have to share her with him again. Sometimes she would take priority, but, and I would just be left there waiting for him to come back. And after Chad's second bone marrow transplant, I became top wife again. The treatment plan had worked, and we had a really, really good summer together. And we did everything on our bucket lists and went to Europe and did road trips on every weekend we had the opportunity to. And we had a, this summer where we were in an exclusive relationship, just him and I, and I was very happy. But then, a few months later, she came back, and the threesome was on again. We embraced it for a few months, trying to figure out the balance between him and her and I. But then she became more powerful than me. And then she became more powerful than Chad. And Chad passed away eight years ago, and he was only 34. For me, my whole story went dark. The life I had known was gone, and the chapters ahead of me looked blank. But the second time multiple myeloma came into my life, it would change my course of the story again, and it was only a few months again after Chad left. I was clearing out a closet of ours, um, finding out he was actually a bit of a hoarder. I was going through a trash bag, wondering why he decided to keep household man manuals that were in Spanish, and prescriptions from before he was sick, and. Um, why we needed to figure out how our fridge could operate from 10 years ago. But at the bottom of the bag, before I threw it out, I rummaged through the bottom just to make sure nothing else was there, and I found a diary. And Chad had kept a diary when he was first diagnosed when he was 26 years old. And I combed through its pages. I knew the story really well, so I sort of looked, just sort of, thumbed through it, and in the back of the diary, though, what I wasn't expecting to read, Chad had written, publish this book when the time is right. So that's what I started doing. I started combining Chad's stories with mine, diary entries and blog posts and Christmas cards and emails while we were away from one another. And I pulled, the story to, I pulled the story of us together. Three years after I thought my story was over, Our Interrupted Fairy Tale was published and a new chapter of my life opened. My original goal was maybe to have 100 of my family read the book for my aunts and cousins and whoever I could convince to read it. But as it turns out, that Chad's story and our story um, had a bigger reach than we could have known. There have been over 2,000 copies of our interrupted fairy tale sold now, and not just in Canada, but through, throughout the U.S. and uh, Europe. And it's now an award winner, and our story has been shared across newspapers and radio shows and TV stations, and it's recently brought me to Hollywood as it's being turned into a screenplay. And it's brought me in front of you guys today as well. <laughs> Thank you. There's been a lot of conversations and opportunities that I've had because of this sharing our story. And I've spoken with a lot of people and sometimes patients, but a lot of the time they're people who just like lots of people have had cancer touch their lives or there's some people who just like to talk because they also had a boyfriend who was nine years older than them and they like to talk about that too. <laughs> but the greatest thing that has happened since this new chapter has unfolded is actually the third way that multiple myeloma has entered my life. And the biggest impact it's ever had was recently when I received two different messages from people that I didn't know. The first was uh, from a new nursing student here in Vancouver, and she wrote me and said, Hi, Megan, something from clinical today that I wanted you to know. 
I was caring for a patient with multiple myeloma and he was at the end of his stay and was being discharged home. I was helping him pack up his room and came across your book. I asked him about it and he had said that he had also read it. He told me that this book is the reason I'm still living. If Chad could have fought as hard as he did for as long as he did, he, I sure as hell might as well give it a shot. I read his chart that explained two years ago this patient was given six months to live. So I just wanted to say thank you and thank you for helping keep my patients alive in ways that I can't. The second message came from one of, Chad, one of Chad's ex-girlfriends who lived in Texas. Hi Megan, I'm not, sure even, I'm not sure if this message will even reach you, but I wanted to tell you something important. After I read that Chad had passed away, I followed you and I read the book and I sobbed through the whole thing and I wanted to hug you both. But it has inspired me to register with Be The Match Stem Cell and Marrow Donor Program four years ago. I've just gotten a call saying I'm a match with a 26-year-old female and I'm going to go through with it. I can only hope to do as half as good for this person as Chad's donor did for him. I guess my point is, is that I don't know this girl, but your words and your story have inspired me to donate. So my story didn't turn out the way that I was expecting it to, and Chad's didn't either. And I'm willing to bet that for those of you in the room, your story isn't turning out the way that you expected it to as well. But I hope that in sharing a little bit about the three different times that myeloma has come into my life, that you realize whether you're a caregiver or a patient or a professional working through the plot twists that myeloma has brought into your life, that you recognize how much power your story holds. And your story will hold power in now, in the short term, but it also is going to hold so much power so far into the future that you can't even see it. So I hope that no matter what happens in the next chapters of your very resilient and very determined life, that you know that your fight and your story is absolutely worth it. It makes a difference. So thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Thank you, truly inspiring. Uh, Megan Dunn, I'm sorry. Oh, you hoisted back. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so I not okay. First of all, what are your next steps? Um, <laughs> well, I think I should also preference that or preface that. So um, this the screenwriter who actually brought this to light for me is that when she, she came up to Vancouver because she wanted to experience our life together and be walked through a few of the things that happened in the book, and. She, on the fourth day of her being here, she's like, you know, I'm getting the feeling that, like, you guys didn't, like, Chad didn't really talk about his disease very much. And it was funny because being Chad's partner in all of this, I, like, I knew a little bit, but I also recognized how private he was about sharing his story because he was very, for like, I want to say he probably didn't, he didn't share from diagnosed at 26 
till like not ever knowing it was his last few months he didn't start sharing until probably he was like 34 and a half <laughs> or so and it was her observation that she's like and she's asked why was he what was what is this about because from what i'm gathering his friends didn't really know what was going on until the end and I, what I witnessed is that Chad was very determined to not be Chad with cancer and not have this story, def or not have his illness define who he was and what he liked to do. So he would go to his friend's poker nights and sit there and he would have a pick line in his neck and just wear a sweater. And only once in a while would it show and somebody would be like, is everything okay? And he's like, oh, it's dumb, it's fine. And it, he like did that for a long time. And what changed was he, we, he and I went to see a documentary of a friend of mine who um, her, they did a, she had cystic fibrosis and they did a big documentary on her at the Vancouver Film Festival. And he saw her with this decision to have shared her story so publicly. And what he realized is that he was never looking at Ava as Ava with cystic fibrosis. He was always looking at Ava as like, how cool is this girl who is making, who is trying to turn the worst scenario into something that could help other people. So that's what decided, that was sort of the tipping point for Chad to be able to start sharing his story because he had been so protective of himself and not having to bring on a team of people to help support and help share the story, but for him it ended up being more therapeutic than it was anything because he was just so head down and so head fo focused on trying to conquer this thing that he didn't realize that there's a lot of us around who are like ready to help and just like maybe just listen because not I mean not very many people especially in our friend group knew even how to pronounce my mu multiple myeloma the number of times like does he have a skin cancer or something like myeloma <laughs> so <laughs> but to answer your question about what's for ne what's next steps is um i have started writing a sequel because i have all i sorry i've started writing a sequel to the book because what I wasn't expecting the same way I wasn't anticipating so many people being being able to pull something from our story I've also found love now and there's been a lot of intertwining in Chad's life and this life and um, it kind of speaks to a different type of audience of like how do you love after loss and how does somebody else fall in love with somebody when you haven't when they haven't fallen out of love with somebody else. So it's a, it's a different story. It's not, uh, it doesn't break your heart the same way that this, this first book might, but it's, a di it, it's something that's kind of been asked of me. So I will, um, we'll see, I'll see how it goes. I think uh, sort of one thought, and sorry, I hope I'm not taking up no, the please. stage here, but to, I think now it is important to try and encourage others, I mean, uh, to tell their story. And I was saying to Pat, who has a story, and everybody has a story, but bringing it back to myeloma, is that if you can't uh, write your own story, um, I brought into our support group um, for a lunch uh, presenter at a, at a workshop I organized for the, for the support group that I run on myeloma. He, he is a histor, well, he has a degree, he's a historian, but he started his own small business in um, he will write your story. Uh, if you feel you can't write your own story. And so you can either have a visual story uh, put together by him, or he will actually write the family history and put visuals in it. So I, what I really liked about it is that you, you express that or you got that story out. And um, it might be something to encourage um, wherever you're going to present <laughs> the members in the audience to to do that doesn't have to go to the movie stage so it looks like you're right you haven't finished writing your own story yet. no i hope not but i hope that nobody here has finished writing theirs either <laughs> but i um 
I now work for a company that does ghost writing and does memoir. Like they've, they've come up with a 50 page memoir package. So um, I do look forward to this. It sounds very similar, but I look forward to that. So yeah, I like now I like reading other people's stories too. So yes. I'm wondering if you haven't been visiting the Myeloma Canada headquarters, because you know what they started to do in their newsletters? People have been writing their stories. Like, I love that story about, I think his last name was Stevenson, he was a farmer, and he told his story. Not, not long, but it was fascinating. And as I was, that's why I say, I think you've been down to their headquarters and given them a tip because I it is fascinating <laughs> to hear people's stories because we have so much to learn. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad thank to hear that. Thank you for sharing I, yours I, and taking that big risk and sharing that. Thanks. And I think not everybody's story has to be done so publicly as I have done it. And, but it's more just the, and if any, if there, if I were to have any, like suggestion for anyone it's if if it's not writing and it's not movies it it's maybe just deciding to like tell somebody about what's going on right because sometimes like they want to know most often they want to know but what I witnessed firsthand was what it does to like let it out like let the pressure out of the balloon a little bit and let it go because it's there's people who want to hear it and you're not burdening anybody by sharing it right so Anyways. Come in, come in, you're far. Hold on, yeah, okay. That's okay. You can I can hear you. Oh, it's our interrupted fairy tale. Oh, okay. And and Megan does have copies with her. Megan, thank you very thank much you so indeed. Much. That's wonderful. Legal and inspiring, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.